Matthew. They were all filled. Hallelujah. How many want to be filled? Amen. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. I've got a couple people in here that don't want to be filled. You may want to leave right now. This is not going to be a good service for you. Hallelujah. You know, I'm just joking. Uh, some people are just, you know, I'm not going to raise my hand. That's okay. I know you want to be filled or you wouldn't be here this morning. Amen. You wouldn't ask God for his fullness. You wouldn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're here today talking about Pentecost. And uh, we're celebrating Pentecost. Of course, we're not, it's not exactly right on the day of Pentecost uh, in regards to the Jewish festival, Jewish feast. But it is a Jewish feast, and it was known in the uh, Old Testament as the, the w- first, the week of f- uh, Feast of Weeks, I should say, or the Day of First Fruit, celebrating the first buds of the harvest. It was 49 days, or 49 days, yes, and an extra day, uh, 50 days from Passover. And um, it was exactly the time when the church was birthed. So that's what we're, we're talking about. One of the things that had to happen there were three great feasts that God required that all the, the men would come to Jerusalem to celebrate. And of course, they brought all their, their families with them. Uh, Passover, Pentecost, and then also tabernacles. Uh, P- Passover and Pentecost were spring feasts. Fall feast is tabernacles. Uh, we do believe that these feasts are very prophetic, that Jesus Christ fulfilled those feasts when he walked the, the first feast, the, the spring feast, uh, Passover, first fruits, uh, unleavened bread, which is combined in a Jewish festival that is most of the time referred to as Passover. And then also, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. So, what we're talking about today is very significant to the church, and it's very important that we recognize that uh, the church needs the fire of Holy Spirit. Do you agree with that? Okay. Without that, we just become a social club. And, uh, you know, a social club isn't going to get it. There's lots of social clubs out there that you can be involved with. Go find one of them if that's what you want is a social club. But the church needs to be a place where there's fire, where there's vigor, where there's anticipation of what God is going to do. When we come together, we should anticipate that something is going to happen that's going to be unusual. That's right. That we're not going to just come in here every Sunday, three hymns. Of course, we don't use hymns, but we, we sing songs, three songs, and, you know, a message, and then we're out the door. And we're, we'll just come back next week, and the same old, same old, old hum is going to happen. Come on. We should be coming in here with the great anticipation of what God wants to do in our individual lives and our corporate lives. We should be able to see some move of God's Spirit. We should see some manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Now, if you're not of the the charismatic Pentecostal persuasion, you're probably thinking, oh, my goodness, what am I viewing or what am I getting into here? Well, I'll tell you what you're getting into. You're getting into the same thing that the, the early church, the New Testament church established, and that is the baptism, the holiness of God, the power of God, the Holy Spirit moving and directing the church. He's in control. Let's read the scripture this morning that I want to share with you. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And I'll spare you the bad Honda jokes this morning. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Next. 
And they were appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. And there was dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in their own language. Next, we hear them speaking in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? Hallelujah. What could this mean? Acts 2.13 says, others mocking said they were all full of new wine. Yes, there are always going to be mockers. But what could this mean? This outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this speaking in tongues thing, this uh, turmoil that it seemed like. It seemed like there was a bunch of confusion, but God was totally in control and it was directing the whole thing. And people were standing back and wondering, What's, what in the world is going on? What is going on? is God was pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. The Holy Spirit came to indwell man. That means God came to live in you, in me, in us. Why shouldn't we have the manifestation of the power of God in our life? He lives inside of us. He walks with us wherever we go, and take, keep that in mind. Wherever you go, you're taking God with you. Be careful where you go. Be careful what you see. Remember that song when we were kids? Careful little eyes, ears, mouth. Be careful what we say, do, look at. Be very careful. You should, if you do, if you're doing something that you know is inappropriate, you should have a conviction in your heart because Holy Spirit's living in there. A Baptist preacher and his wife wanted a dog. They knew that when they went to get a dog, they wanted that dog to be a good Baptist dog. So they went to the kennel. And they explained to the, the, the manager there that they wanted a good Baptist dog. And he said, I've got the perfect dog for you. He went out and he got this dog and brought it in. And uh, he said, the reason this is the perfect dog for you is because watch what he can do. And he said, go fetch the Bible. And the dog went and got the Bible and brought it back to him. He said, that's not the only thing he can do. Watch this. He said, find Psalms 23. And with incredible dexterity, the dog with his paws flipped the Psalms 23 and pointed to the Scripture. The man and his wife, the Baptist preacher and his wife were so impressed, they bought the dog right on the spot. They took the dog home. And that night, they had some friends from church come over. And they wanted to show off their Baptist dog. So they showed him the things that the dog could do. And one of the gentlemen said to the pastor, he said, Pastor, uh, he can do these incredible things, but can he do just regular dog tricks? The pastor said, well, I don't know. And he pointed to the dog and he said, heal. The dog jumped up on the chair, put his paw on the the head of the man and started howling. The pastor (laughs) turned to his wife and she said, he said, Honey, we've been swindled. This is a Pentecostal dog. (laughs) Oh, praise God. Now, that was a little bit over the top, huh? But sometimes that's what people think of when they think of Pentecostal, when they keep think of charismatic, they think of something that's crazy and over the top. And maybe rightfully so, because if we'd have been there on the day of Pentecost, we'd have been wondering, what in the world is going on? What's happening? 
every time the Spirit of God is poured out on the people of God, incredible, unusual things happen. That's why it's incumbent upon us not to allow ourselves to get complacent and to be satisfied with the status quo. That's why I, as pastor, have to to recognize that I've got to many times step out of my comfort zone. I like it when we come in here and and sing three hymns and a her and go home. That's my comfort zone. But God has much more for us. And I want what God wants in this place. I want what God wants in my life. I want what God wants in our community and our nation. I want the power of God manifest. Let me get myself out of the way. Hallelujah. So we can see the manifestation of God's spirit in this place. Unity is the first thing I want to share with you this morning. Word of God said they were all in one accord. The Greek word there means with one mind, with one passion. It's a compound word. It means with one mind and one passion. The image that this conjures up is of a massive choir, all singing different parts in perfect harmony, pitch, and tone. Perfectly. Not one person off key. Now, all those people are singing different parts. They have different talents, different different abilities. But because they're in perfect harmony, it sounds beautiful. That's what that's the kind of harmony we need in the church. That's the kind of unity. Leonard Bernstein said once he was asked, what's the most difficult instrument to play? And he thought about it for a minute, and he said, I believe it's second fiddle. Because you see, I can get lots of people who want to play first fiddle, first violin. But to get someone who will play second fiddle with enthusiasm and excitement is not that easy. You know, as the church of Jesus Christ, we're really all in a second fiddle position. Even as the pastor of Bethel, I play second fiddle to Jesus. Jesus should be the lead. Jesus should be the one conducting everything that we do. Yes, we want to be in harmony. We want to be in unity. Absolutely. But we need to look to our Lord Jesus Christ And allow him to order our steps as he has promised that he's going to do. Listen to what Romans says here. Romans 15, 22, beginning with 22. Or 2, I'm sorry, I don't know why I've got 22 written down here. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written... The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may, with one accord and one mouth, glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the, the reason I read this scripture to you is because I want you to understand that being in unity, being in one accord, doesn't necessarily mean that we all agree on everything. We're going to have these, these difference of opinions about things. The question is, can we have the difference of opinion and still walk in love toward one another? Can we be in a position where, uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with Darren, but I'm going to walk in love toward Darren no matter what. And he's going to walk in love toward me. Besides, he's a whole lot bigger than me. (laughs) I'm a smart guy. I don't mess with Darren. This mind here, Romans 15, 16, 
that you may with one mind. It's the same Greek word used in Acts as one accord. They are of one accord. One mind. Translated from, from that same Greek word. People, we're talking about harmony here. Not everybody singing the same part, but harmonizing together. Being willing to put aside our own, ourselves, our own desires sometimes and our own uh, voice. Sometimes we just have to keep our mouth shut. Amen? And I'm not just talking about just going along to get along. I'm talking about learning to love one another and walk in that love. Aesop has a, a fable. In that fable, there was an old man who had seven sons, and they were always falling out with each other, arguing all the time. And one day, the, the old man bundled up a bunch of uh, sticks, put them in a great big bundle, and he br- called his seven sons together. And his, uh, he handed it around to each one of those sons and said, break all these twigs together. And of course, they couldn't do it. Then he untied it, and he handed each one of them a twig, and he said, now break them. And they were able to break them. The moral of his story, of course, is that when you were in unison, you can do so many, so much more. A cord of three strands, according to Ecclesiastes, is not easily broken. Unity. It's that important in the body of Christ. We must stay in unity, unified with one another in the love of Jesus Christ. Second thing I share with you this morning, that these were devout men. Acts 2, 5, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Devout men were men reverencing God, pious people, or people seeking God. God seekers. You know, uh, there are some things about churches. There's churches that are very seeker sen- sensitive. And I'm, I'm not at all opposed to being seeker sensitive in regards to people coming in and looking, seeking out God. Uh, so, you know, there are some aspects of being seeker sensitive that are very appropriate for the church of Jesus Christ. You know, we want people to come and seek after God. But if we're not careful, we'll become so seeker sensitive that we we become to the place where we're not willing to share things that are so important like sin nature and what sin is. And that everybody needs to repent and turn from their wicked ways. Repentance is such an important part of being a believer in Jesus Christ. If we just welcome everybody in and say, you can live any way you want to live, just say Jesus is Lord and you'll be all right, we're doing them a great disservice. We must preach the true word of God. And we must say everyone must repent, turn from your wicked ways, receive Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a salvation process here that works. Are you going to be perfect after that? Praise God. None of us would be here if that's the case. There's not perfection in Christ. There's just grace and forgiveness. But God is working on our hearts. And that's what this is saying. People who were seeking after God. These were men from nations all over. Devout men. Seekers of God. Listen, when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it turns your life upside down. No, I say it turns your life right side up. Your life was already upside down. You just didn't realize it. Christ takes you and turns you right side up, and now you start to see things from God's perspective. Everyone else is upside down. Everything else is upside, even a society is upside down because it's not conforming to the things of God. So when we're right side up, we look different to everyone else. We look different to the world system because we are different than the world system. We're new creatures in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 520 says this, 
Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. When we saw, we call good evil and evil good, we're in big trouble. What do I, do I have to, to elaborate on that in, in the, uh, the society that we live in today? Isn't that what's happening? Do we not see if you call evil evil, you're in trouble? If you call good evil, you can go along. What a crazy, crazy place this world is. No wonder the world thinks we're crazy when we speak in tongues, lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, do the things the Scripture tells us to do. And when we're not afraid to talk about it and believe in it. God is alive. The church needs to be alive. We are, we are the body of Christ walking in this earth. And as the body of Christ, things need to be happening because the body is on the move. The body is alive. Amen. We're not a dead body. Amen. We're a live body. That's right. If we're dead, somebody ought to put us in the ground, cover us up. But I'm alive. I'm alive in Jesus Christ. I have the Spirit of God inside of me. I have the power of God walking with me. Hallelujah. It's not just me. It's all those who confess Christ as their personal Savior. There is life in Christ. But it takes devout men and women everywhere to do the work of the kingdom of God. Off the coast of Scotland is a small group of islands called the Hebrides. I've talked about this before, but I, I love the stories of the Hebrides revival. I love the stories of all the great revivals that took place. I'm a student of the, the great revivals that have taken place in our nation and, excuse me, and the world. And uh, there's been many, and I believe we're on the verge of another great revival. We're on the verge of incredible negative things happening. I want to phrase this correctly. We're on the verge of seeing this world shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Scripture. So we're on the verge of seeing some Very difficult things and going through some very difficult times. But it will be a time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and shine. It will be a time for us to take a stand regardless of what is said about us, regardless what what, uh, happens to us. Come on. I I know we don't like to hear this, but... Is it possible that you may have to give up your life for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to do that? I don't know. Thank God we have the freedoms that we have in this country, but there's no guarantee that it's going to continue. We serve a living God. I believe the church of Jesus Christ has to come to the point where this world no longer holds any interest for us. We love our families, our church, our children. We don't, no one wants to leave them. We all want to live and prosper, and we pray for that. But this world has a hold, a grip on the church of Jesus Christ. We need to let go, release it. Name of Jesus. Devout. Men and women, children, that's what it's going to take. In 1949, the church in the Hebrides Islands was complacent and slumbering. Boy, does that sound familiar. It was almost dead. Young people stopped going to church because it was nothing but a bunch of religious nonsense far as they were concerned. 
Most of them were alienated from them, the church. There was a legalistic spirit. It was about duty rather than devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. It led to a life of, of just lifeless expression. People just were going through the motions. But there was a small cottage along the roadside where two elderly ladies lived in Barvis. These two women were very elderly. They were in the 80s. And neither one of them was in the greatest of health. Peggy and Christine Smith was their names. They were 84 and 82. Peggy was almost blind, and her sister was bent over with arthritis. They couldn't attend public services, but every Sunday, or every, just about every day, they prayed and they sought God. They desired to see the, uh, a manifestation, a move of God. You see, they lived uh, early on in their lives. They lived in a time where uh, the power of God was manifest in the islands. And they saw the mighty move and, and the, the expression of Holy Spirit in the lives of people. And they saw great, wonderful things happen. And they desired that to happen again. They wanted it. I desire for that to happen here. I want it. I want God to move. Because it's the only thing that can really turn things around. It's the only thing that can really make a difference. So they continued pl praying. They continued seeking God. They made their little cottage a sanctuary as they, where they sought Him. And then they received a promise from God from the Scriptures, from Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. They pleaded this promise day and night in prayer for a long time. One night as they prayed, Peggy received a revelation from God. God revealed that there was coming to the church of her fathers a revival. Crowds would fill the churches again. She sent for the minister, and his name was James Murray McKay. I told him what God had shown him. He immediately gathered his elders and deacons and leaders of the church, and they began praying together. At the same time in that district, a group of men praying in a barn ex experienced that just kind of a foretaste of what was coming. They were praying and seeking God, and they, they just wanted the move of God so much that they, they were on their knees before God on a regular basis. And then one young deacon rose and he read part of the 24th Psalm. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? And he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceit, deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Turning to the other brothers, with him, he said this, it seems to me just so much humbug to be waiting and praying as we are if we ourselves are not rightly related to God. Then lifting his hands toward heaven, he cried, oh God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? He didn't go any further, but he fell prostrate on the floor. Then suddenly an awareness of God filled the barn, and streams of the Holy Spirit just ushered in one right after another. All those men fell in the presence of God. They had tasted what God was going to do in the Hebrides. They were experiencing the power of Holy Spirit moving, moving in the lives of of individuals who cry out to him, and most important, who are willing to get their hearts right with God. They repented. They sought God. They recognized they're just men, human beings, 
who make mistakes. But because of the grace of God, we can cry out to him. With those events, the pastor, there's two things happening. The pastor enlisted an evangelist, Duncan Campbell, to come. He was a well-known evangelist in the area. He came to Lewis Island, and he was to be there for two weeks. He ended up being there for two years as God filled the churches all over the Hebrides Islands. Incredible miracles and things took place. People's hearts were turned back to the living God. But I want, I want you to understand something. We cannot be afraid of the manifestation of the Spirit of God. Things happened during that revival that were not accepted by the mainstream churches. I want you to know that any time the body of Christ rises up and becomes the body of Christ, just like they abused the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the religious Pharisees will rise up and say, this is not of God. It can't be. You have to be secure enough in yourselves and in your, your salvation to know and to be able to discern what is and what isn't of God. God's going to move. God will move in unusual ways. We may not see a revival like they saw in the Hebrides. I'm not trying to tell you that we should be looking for it. I think what we should be looking for is whatever God wants. Be open to what the Spirit of God does. And be willing to embrace whatever that new move is. Because when God pours out His Spirit, things always happen in a new way. A new spirit. Well, it's not a new spirit. It's a Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit renews things and makes things new and changes the way he ministers. I believe if we're going to see a move of God like this, it's going to take the body of Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, to trust our God and be willing to allow the manifestation of the Spirit to move among us. Third thing I'm going to share with you this morning is the wonderful works of God. Acts 2.11. We hear them speaking in our own tongues. Oh, the wonderful works of God. There are 16 different languages represented that day from all over the known world of that time. And here's the thing. And we get a little confused about this sometimes because they were speaking. There was speaking in tongues, of course. Tongues of fire came down upon the disciples, 120 in the, the um, uh, upper room, and then they poured out into the streets. And, and as they poured out into the streets, they were speaking with other tongues. Uh, and there was, a, it seemed like great chaos, but it was uh, ordered by Holy Spirit. And people began, to, and here's what it says. Listen to what the Scripture says to us. Because everyone puts a lot of emphasis on the speaking, but we fail to understand that it was all about the hearing. We hear them speaking in our own languages. Could it be that the manifestation, could it be that the real miracle was they each person heard whatever was being spoken in their own language rather than the language being spoken? Can that be a possibility? Hallelujah. If that's the case, the miracle is even more powerful than we ever thought. As they spoke by the power of Holy Spirit, people heard. And they heard in their language all these different languages. And they glorified God. Oh, the wonderful works of God. I don't know. I wasn't there. None of us really do know what exactly took place that day. But I can tell you this. It was incredible. I want incredible in this place. I want the wonderful works of God here. Listen, God's doing some great things among us. 
I'm so excited about what God's doing in individual lives. Uh, we, we have so many people that, that do things that are willing to minister and, and be involved with different aspects of, of ministry. And, you know, I'd have to name every one of you sitting out here today if I was going to encourage everyone this morning. But I'd just like to, a couple of people that recently have really just kind of stepped up and I've seen God doing some incredible things in their life. And how God is, is moving, he's, he's touching people, receiving the fullness of his spirit, and people are willing to be bold and step out to do the things of God. First person I just want to mention to you did a ministry minute this week, and we've had lots of people do them, and they've done great jobs. But Christy Maxey, I was so impressed with, with what she did. It was so incredible. And you know, how long have you been coming here, Christy? Four? Six years? Okay. <laughs> I'm not very good with time. Six? Okay. Somewhere around there. Six years. God has been touching her. She's, she, she and Tony stepped up to, to, to be the leaders of our, our uh, Man and More ministry. And doing other things in the church. She's teaching a, a, a Bible group in Parkersburg. Hallelujah. Part of the body. She's doing the, the ministry minute when we ask her to. She didn't even hesitate. Jumped right in there. And, of course, we've had other people doing that. And I'm so thankful. You know, I, I don't want to just try to name everybody because I'll miss someone. But I'm thankful for all of you who get involved. I'm thinking about Bob Taylor, Bob and Kathy, you know, good people, born again believers when they came in this place, schooled in the church of Christ, good solid doctrine, but they knew nothing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when we started speaking and teaching and sharing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they wanted that thing. <laughs> they wanted to be filled with the Spirit. And Bob came to, to one of our classes as I was teaching on the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and he asked for prayer because he wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He didn't immediately begin speaking in tongues. And don't be discouraged if you do not, if you get filled with the Spirit. I'm, I'm going to teach more next week on being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So hang in there. If you're, you're watching... Uh, through our media uh, outlet here today, hang in there because I'm going to explain all this stuff. But I just want you to understand who we are and what we believe, and we do not back down from the power of God, the manifestation of God's Spirit. We believe in it. And I prayed for Bob that night, and, and I told him, and I'm going to tell all of you, if you ask for the Spirit of God, Scripture tells us if you ask, the Father's not going to give you a snake or a stone. He's going to give you good things. He's going to give you what you ask for. Amen. So we asked for it. We laid hands on him. And he did not manifest. And, but as he was driving home, he got down to Locust Grove, started going home. And he said he began speaking in tongues all the way home. No one forced him. No one had to teach him. He opened his mouth. And that's what I told him. You've got to open your mouth. And he did. And my goodness, I want to tell you something. God is using him in the workplace right now to minister to people. He Brought one guy that, that he's working with, he brought him to the Lord. And he's setting an example in the workplace. He's an ambassador for Christ. That's what we all are. We're ambassadors for Christ. And when we get on fire for the Lord and we seek more and desire more, God uses us in a greater way. The power of God is released for each and every one of us. The wonderful works of God. 
And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maidservants and on my, my men servants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Hallelujah. No one is left out. Listen, you young people, God's not leaving you out. Please know that. God wants you to minister to other people. He wants you to be bold. He wants to use you to lay hands on the sick, to cast out devil, to preach the good news. There's no reason for you to cower in the front, in front of the enemy. You have Holy Spirit in you. And if you don't, we will help you. You have all that you need to stand up and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We need you, you teenagers, you preteens. We need you. The body of Christ needs you like we've never needed anyone before. Right now, we need you because you're the voice of the next generation coming up that's going to lead this nation. And we need you to speak out that Jesus is Lord and King. It's human nature, nature to want comfort and security. Do we all believe that? But listen, it's God's nature to require courage and trust. That's what he's always required of his people. You go back through the, 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 the Word of God. Each time that he called someone, they had to have courage and they had to trust God. You can name all of them. Noah, Abraham, uh, Joshua, Mo, no, Moses. You can just go through New Testament, the disciples. They all had to have courage and they all had to trust the living God. We're not going to reach the world of Jesus with Jesus Christ by cursing the darkness. The darkness is there. It's dark. It's a dark world. But we can't curse it. We're here to shine light on it. We can't curse it and we can't conform to it. Neither of those things is going to work. We've tried both. For years we tried cursing the darkness. Now we're trying to conform to it. Neither one will work. The only thing that's going to work is a people of God who is ignited by the Spirit of God to move in the power of God. John Wesley once said, if we Christians catch fire, the world will come watch us burn. Let me verify that with a last story this morning. On Father's Day, June 18th, 1995, at Brownsville Assemblies of God in Pensacola, Florida, revival broke out. Now, there was a lot of criticism about that revival. But remember what I said, the Pharisees will always criticize the move of God. Maybe some things happened that shouldn't have. That always happens too. The enemy always tries to get in and tries to stir and stop what God is doing. But that revival that broke out lasted five years, from 95 to around 2000. During that period of time, now listen, I want you to understand that the Spirit of God, when He's truly moving, people will be drawn to that spirit. It always happened. It happens in the Hebrides. It happened during the Great Awakenings. It happened in uh, uh, other places. Uh, there was revivals at Brownsville. The Spirit of God drew the people. John Kilpatrick was the pastor 
of that church. And, and I love John Kilpatrick. I, I like listening to him. I believe he is truly a man of God. He's not there any longer. He's pastoring other, elsewhere. But he was a pastor, and he cried out to God for revival. He said he would go into the sanctuary and, and uh, lay on the pews and just moan and cry to God that they needed revival, just like we need revival today. Not once did they advertise their revival, but that revival broke out. And for five years it went on. The Spirit of God just continued to draw people. People came from all over the world. Remember, it wasn't advertised. They just came. According to the statistics that was gathered, four million people visited that church in five years, all drawn by the Holy Spirit, many of whom were not believers in Jesus Christ when they came there, but they were when they left. Many came because they wanted an impartation of what God was doing there to take back home, and a lot of people did. Man, that was many years ago. We need another move of God, an impartation of the Holy Spirit that draws people everywhere from all over the world, whether it's here in the church down the road, a church in California, I don't care. I want the Spirit of God to move. Let it move among hundreds of churches everywhere where people are crying out for the presence of God. Remember this. As we move forward from this position where we are right now, as the Hebrews were preparing to enter into the promised land, Joshua tells them this. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whatever we do, whatever happens, the Lord our God is with us, and we can trust him. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to... Uh, end our streaming service at this time. Thank you for being with us. We hope that you receive something. If you would like to contact somebody at the church, please do go to our website, get information, contact us. If uh, we're making an impact in your life, we'd like to know about that. God bless and have an awesome day.